Hey everyone, I'm Chris Guthridge, podcaster and broadcaster at 4playernetwork.com, and these are my top 10 games of 2017. Hey, Nolan. Hey. Hey, guess what my number 10 game this year was? Star Trek Bridge Crew. <laughs> it was, because you're looking at the list. It was absolutely Star Trek Bridge Crew, which is a game that I know none of you have played. I nope. didn't, even though I had it in my possession for quite a while when I was borrowing the VR, I did not, it's a did shame. not touch it. I'm so sorry. It's a shame. It's such a unique okay, experience. Exactly. So I, I think um, I think what's so cool about this game is that it was very much a direct fantasy fulfillment for me, you know? Yes. I, I think one of the, one of the cool things... Maybe the cool thing about VR, the thing that we all think about when we think about virtual reality is kind of the holodeck concept of being able to just like step into scenarios and environments that we've always wanted to see and do things that we've always wanted to do and feel like we're actually doing it. Absolutely. Okay. That's exactly what this was for being part of the bridge crew of a Star Trek starship. Yes. And it was fucking mind-blowing for me like i I, it mm, i don't know this game doesn't even have that much going on with it there there's maybe like i don't know a dozen dozen somewhere between a dozen and 20 different missions and and they're all pretty basic like like navigate from point a to point b fight these starships navigate over here scan this thing you know that kind of stuff is there a connective story that runs throughout it or yeah i'm pretty sure there is i honestly didn't play much of the story i i just did mostly online stuff which yeah. which is very um ad hoc very just like pick a mission and run it um the story i believe does revolve around a specific starship called the aegis if i'm remembering cor- correctly i didn't prepare for this at all by the way um <laughs> and it is doing pretty generic starfleet things like oh the klingons are over here could you go check that out for us or hey there's an anomaly that we want to scan could you get on that and you're just kind of doing that right the 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 one thing i will say about the single player was kind of cool is that it's the only part of the game where you use this like voice command system that they have built in Mm -hmm. where you 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 hold a command button and you literally can say phrases like from the show and things happen you know and and it, the interface there is you look at a crew member that crew member's highlighted and then you'll say things but you they, they've programmed enough variable responses that like you can say things kind of differently to get the same result so you can actually use phrases like red alert or engage or make it so and stuff like and like they all know what you're saying you know it's pretty cool what's up Noel? how was the the multiplayer experience okay, playing with other people that is exactly why this game is on my list because that was cool that was really fucking cool to hop into a multiplayer session of this game with strangers from around the world and all of us already kind of speaking the same language, the communal language of Star Trek. You know what I'm saying? You share a common bond yes. by default because you're playing this game. Yeah, I, I think like I, I've mentioned this on the podcast before, and I think the barrier to entry to this game is such that like generally you're only going to run into people who really want to be playing this, you know, yeah. or a couple rich assholes who I guess have a bunch of money to burn for no reason. Um, but there, there's there's this. Very quickly, the the community of people playing this kind of distilled down to like you know fans, you know. So everyone that you're playing with has that kind of love of Star Trek and that want to experience this thing that you're doing, this very weird specific thing that you're doing together. Um, 
the the interaction between like the different stations like what everyone's doing is really really neat because they found a way so so when you're when you're doing different jobs like you're you're operating the helm or you're operating you know the the tactical station like firing phasers and torpedoes they had to basically make all that up okay yeah. you don't there's there's not really like in, in the show you don't see what people are doing when they're like pressing buttons and shit sometimes they'll show a console that's they're just, just like, kind of miming it yeah like on there there's no like real definitive uh, system or, 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 you know, kind of design for how these systems should work. You, you hear them talk about what they're doing and you kind of, you kind of build an understanding from there. But, but Ubisoft had to kind of go in and basically decide what does an operations officer see on their console? What are they actually doing minute to minute while they're working the ops station? You know, what, yeah. do, what is the helmsman actually doing to move the starship? You know, and, and I think what Ubisoft came up with for each of the stations works very well. And, and they're all very engaging and very interesting, and they have the right level of engagement and difficulty to make it almost kind of puzzly. Like, yeah. kind of like when we were playing Space Team a few mm-hmm. years back, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it's not quite as actively throwing, like, wrenches into the works like Space Team does, but when you're working at Ops and, and the captain's saying, like, okay, we need to increase power to the phasers to, to blow up this thing or something, you have to actually sit there and, like, play a little mini game with, with the, with the, with the, um, uh, oh, what do they call it? The the, the EPS system, yeah. EPS conduits, like the the power system of the ship to to make sure that you're you're putting enough power in this system, taking power away from this system, but you can't overload this system that because you might FTL break too. it. Like it, yeah, it's very FTL, and, and it, it's just it was really fun and and ultimately my, the reason why this game is on this list is is for very kind of non specific emotional reaction that I got playing this game, you know? Like, I hopped into an online game, I was playing with a group of people who knew what they were doing, I was still kind of learning the ropes, and, and they put me on Helm, and they're saying things like, okay, Helm, bring us around to a course heading of 420.3, you know? And I'm looking at my station, and it's like, oh, I can see all the heading indicators, and I just turn the ship, and I'm like, I captain, and increasing full impulse, you know? <laughs> and, and it's just, it was so fucking cool, it was so great, and it was a wonderful experience that I've always wanted to have, and this game gave it to me, so that is why it is my number 10. Sounds magical. All right, my number nine game is one that I know Nick really enjoyed and one that I don't think Nolan has had a chance to play yet, but definitely should make time for in the future. I'm speaking, of course, of... Horizon Zero Dawn. Oh my god. It's a pretty good game. Oh, I love this game. Next pretty good game, right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I I the thing that I really really enjoyed about this game was the world, was the setting. What was the the overall the overarching fiction that they created for this game. Uh I found it to be very compelling and very interesting and and a lot more fleshed out and a lot broader than I had expected from the kind of basic setup we had been given prior to launch of like oh well this is a post-apocalyptic world where machine dinosaurs exist you know it's definitely a lot more it's definitely a lot more fleshed out and like authentic feeling than that i think exactly like you you have a world with with many different characters and people and and even societies like different communities of people that are all very different from one another and and a lot of what's going on isn't just about kill the robot dinosaurs you know it 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 has a lot to do with with like political intrigue between these warring tribes and and cities and factions and 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 a lot of really good storytelling i feel like absolutely I, i think aloy was a really awesome character um, so I, crispy, I can I can say the reason this isn't on my top ten. Yeah, I have played it, but I don't think I okay. got to the part. What you're talking about? All yeah. I've played is the very beginning and then exploring the world. I haven't yeah. got to the story. I think so. I haven't that hook. Hasn't so you haven't done like yet. the brave trials, like where she goes to become a brave. I don't know. That's like that's really early on. Maybe. Maybe maybe. You're right. I just like I said. I think I enjoy what I played. I think the world is beautiful. I did enjoy yeah. uh, combat with these you know creatures and stuff. But I didn't get to the part that I guess like really hooked me. Like finding out more about like so- the society they're in and stuff. And I, I, I guess that's that's 
why I put it down, and I, I I'm going to play it eventually. It but. starts to de- it starts eventually starts to get back into that kind of stuff and starts to ramp up the the political intrigue, as as Crispy put it. Right. I I really enjoy the story from the aspect of of it being kind of a sociological think piece of like what you know what kind of different cultures would arise out of the ashes of this like highly advanced futuristic human civilization that kind of just collapses suddenly and violently um and i think a lot of the ideas and a lot of the 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 characters that they created for that uh worked extremely well and were very very inspired uh i this is this is one of the the few worlds in a year filled with great gaming worlds where i was like i would love to come back to this over and over again to see how all sorts of different aspects of life in this world work i honestly uh, think if this becomes like i'm um, which i'm sure it will if this continues on and becomes like a really big series i think that's going to be like one of the main aspects that they're going to explore from game to game absolutely is how each like imagine just like you can imagine going to a completely different part of the country or of, of you know the continent that they're on that you would find very different versions of these civilizations cropping up that would be totally different from what you experience in this game just mm. because they don't have a way of really communicating the same way that they did before when before the world collapsed on them exactly so. I, I i just i think i think that guerrilla studios did a really good job i i think this was a great great way for them to uh kind of break out of of being the kill zone studio oh yeah you know and i hope that this game leads to uh, as much as i would like to see more games of this series of, of this franchise going forward i i also that i also hope that this makes them a a more broader resource in sony's like first party studios you know yeah I absolutely hope they, i hope they get a chance to explore other they've cool. demonstrated that they can definitely break apart from break away from what they're kind of universally known for known as to do something absolutely. totally different absolutely i mean this is a great game really disappointing that it came out so early in the year and i don't know where i was going with that <laughs> <laughs> that's all right we can it doesn't matter it's a good game <laughs> Cool. I can crop around that. That last bit. No, leave it. Leave it? <laughs> the truth. <laughs> truth. It's truth. You know what, guys? The next game on my list, number eight, is one that I noticed is not on either of your you use twos lists, Man, Nick or being Nolan. called out. Well, I mean, I put good games on my list. Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ! I want you to look Mario in the face when you say that because my number eight game of 2017 was Super Mario Odyssey. You know what? You know what? We've talked a lot. We have about this game, and we've talked a lot about its perceived shortcomings. Yes, and I've heard your arguments, and I've understood your arguments and I've taken them in and I've come to the conclusion that your arguments are all valid but do not detract from the overall goodness of this game because this game believe it or not is absolutely delightful it is this game is really 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 fun I think I I mean it was enough fun that I played it and it made me want to buy a switch which you know like has that happened yet? A game that a game that will sell me a console has to be pretty good. It has to be like top ten quality to get me there. You know what? Is this the best Mario game that's ever been made? You know what? No, it's not. But I also, agree. the question has to be asked: Does that matter? No, it doesn't. Because I think there have been some absolutely phenomenal installments in that franchise over the years. I mean, it is practically, you know, it is one of the main pillars. Of gaming, it's Super Mario. Yep, it's a, it's right. a household name. Household worldwide, Mario. I mean, come on, it, it's great stuff. Uh, the reason why I like this game, I think, I think what, I think what encapsulates my love of this game best is is how many different ideas it explores. It maybe doesn't get too even crazy. on a level to level basis too. Yes, on a level to level basis. On a mechanic to mechanic basis, this this game is trying to do a lot of different things, and, and none of these ideas necessarily have a crazy amount of depth to them. These 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 are all ideas that maybe wouldn't have stood up as 
as tentpole mechanics on their own in other Mario games, but collecting all of them together under one title, I think was a really cool idea. I, I, I really think of Super Mario Odyssey as being kind of like this weird, quirky, kind of almost dumping ground of ideas for Mario games that, that couldn't that couldn't have held their own. It's not that these ideas weren't good. It's just that they, you know, they, 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 they instead of, instead of picking, they one weren't as hook. broad or robust as, as, yeah. you know, something, you know, things that, that, that other Mario games had been built around. Kind of the main thing here, obviously being where he, I guess the, 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 the primary concept in this game or, or mechanic is obviously the using the hat to take over different things. But even right. that becomes like, depending on what you take over mechanics change can change dramatically. Exactly. It's so. less about using the hat to possess things and more about what you're, what, what the things you are possessing can do. Yes. And, and that's where this game's variety comes into play. And I, I think, I think this game, first of all, it's fucking beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's a joy to look at every level. I think looks incredible. I do think it has one of the best soundtracks uh, it has an incredible. It's, it's an incredible soundtrack. soundtrack. The score yeah. is incredible, and, and and the the number the number of ways that this game tries to differentiate itself from previous Mario games, like the 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 the, the number of ways that it it tries to push us out of our comfort zone. You know, even little things like like New Donk City. You know, putting Mario in a modern metropolis type environment filled with like normal looking people it's such a weird con like juxtaposed concept like such a weird thing to see mario running around there but but it it it's charming it works like it just feels different it mm -hmm. just it feels vital you know it, it feels it feels like a worthy step forward for such a monumentally impossible series to you know sequelize because yes. how do you fucking top you know some of the best games that have ever been made. You know, True. Mario 64 will probably always be something that we're striving to to see outdone. Yeah. yeah and if we ever do, but you know, who striving knows. striving to achieve that, that greatness is what leads to Absolutely. really exciting, fun games. And Absolutely. honestly, I'm, I'm very sad that I'm not really going to be talking about this game on my personal top ten. So it was nice to be able to still talk about it a little bit. Yes, I, I'm, I'm glad that it's here because I, I do think it deserves... At least a top ten spot. I mean, this this was a delightful game, and it, it maybe didn't live up to all of our expectations. But at a certain point, I think our expectations surrounding a series such as, the, as this are a little, you know, maybe insurmountable. True, you know. But hey, this game was at least the eighth best game I played in 2017. Hey guys. Hey. Hey. Hey, you know what's an interesting movie? Uh, I, what? Zardoz. Starring Sean Connery. God damn it. Nick, you should watch it. It's really weird. But let's talk about my number seven game. My number seven game for this year was a game called Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. That game's great. That game is pretty good. I'm really, I was surprised. I'm really happy that both of y'all played this before the end of the year. I am too. I, I was really not into like the whole idea of the game. There, there was nothing really grabbing me about this. I never played, uh, what was it, Heavenly Sword? Heavenly Sword, yeah. Right, which was supposedly a prequel to this game or something. Uh, this is more like a spiritual ah, successor. Yeah, Hellblade, Heavenly Sword, I get it. Okay, that makes sense. That's why the game's called Hellblade. And you give me shit that's for not that. Really, there's not really anything in the game that reflects the title Hellblade. She's traveling through hell with... A blade, right? But but the title Hellblade. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it is pushed together as one word, yes. as if it's like a name or a title of something that we never see in the game. Correct. She does get a mystical MacGuffin sword to defeat Hela, the goddess of the underworld, but it's not called the Hellblade. It's I called Grammar, Blade of the Gods, or something like that. Odin's blade, or some shit like that. So why isn't the game? called that or not any, anything but hellblade i don't get it and that's not the point the point is this game was pretty fucking good both as an action fighter game although i did get a little frustrated with the combat towards the end and as a sort of uh atmospheric 
tone poem kind of storytelling adventure. You Atmospheric know? tone poem. Yeah, I mean, this game was very much all about the tone and the atmosphere and, and like, creating these feelings of dread and despair in the player. I mean, the, the, the goal of that went so far as to, as to impose Senua's, like, psychosis on the player, you know? Yes. They really wanted you to feel the confusion and the fear that she feels, and... and I think it largely paid off. They do a lot of that through the audio, too, which is... Right. The audio's pretty intense in right. this game. The audio is very intense in this game. Uh, the sound design is is definitely an achievement here. I think the story was very well constructed, mm-hmm. and I think it was very, very well performed by the few people in the cast involved. Yes. Um, Senua, in particular, is a very... Uh, they, they they achieve a lot in creating a character of depth and and um, uh, she's a crazy lady, right? Uh, she 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 has a lot of depth and she's also very sympathetic. And they do they do a very good job of getting you on board with her over the six hours of this game. They do a better job of that than a lot of twenty, thirty, forty hour games do. True, you know. Um, I was I was really surprised by how much I ended up enjoying this game, and I, I think that is a testament to the quality of the game. That someone like me, who really had no interest in this whatsoever, was like pretty much hooked by about five minutes into it. Um, I would highly recommend it to anybody. It's also a game that a lot of games like this kind of fall apart towards the end, and I feel like that didn't happen. This one this really game. stayed together yeah. very well. It, it, it was a game that, that kind of knew... Exactly how long it should be. Yes. You know? So I, I think I think there was a lot of mature decisions and a lot of restraint shown in this game uh, that, that that kind of preserved the artistic value of it. You know? Absolutely. And, and that, that is why I'm giving it my number seven. The number six game on my list, the last, the best of the games that don't matter is a game that I'm pretty sure might be a gritty reboot slash far future sequel to the Pixar classic Bugs Life, maybe? Oh, Sounds about right. Maybe? Yeah. Maybe. Right? I didn't realize that until just now. I would say it's, New, it's closer to Ants. New headcanon. Yeah. Well, who knows? Hmm. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about Hollow Knight. This game is quite delightful. I think, I think the thing I enjoy most about it don't get me wrong. The, the combat and the mechanics of the game are fantastic. They're great. But the thing that's really keeping me going, the thing that I'm really sinking my teeth into is, is all that wonderfully delicious atmosphere. Oh, oh, atmosphere and, and art direction and design. It, it's, 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 it's dripping. A beautiful game. I don't know. I don't know if I can emphasize enough how impressive I find the overall tone of this game yeah I, I i think i think for any studio let alone let alone a studio that this is like their first major release yeah. for any studio to create a game that has this much kind of mirth and whimsy as well as melancholy and and pathos and, and to blend those elements all together as expertly and naturally as this game does it is incredibly impressive very rare. I, I, I don't like. I, I don't even know how you begin to tackle something like it, you that. You know, it, like it has this like, I, I, like I said, I've only played you know like twenty hours of it so far, but like it is, it's kind of sad. Like it's it gives me this like very melancholy. Yeah, it just, ugh, it just very makes empty. Me... I mean, it, it, it's, it's sad but in a beautiful way. It's sad in a beautiful. That's exactly what I was gonna say, Nick. It's exactly what I was gonna say. You <laughs> have sorry. such a beautiful soul, Nick. I know. It, it is such a beautifully. De- not depressing. It's not depressing, it, but it, it feels you do feel forlorn, looking at at like the city of tears mm-hmm. and, and hearing the stories about like the Hollow Knight and about this this ancient bug kingdom that once flourished beneath our feet that has since fallen into ruin and legend and obscurity. You know? Yeah. It, it it's it's <laughs> shit, man. Shit. It's fucking good. It, it also helps that the gameplay on top of all that is just mwah, wonderful. Very beautiful. demanding of the very, player. Very demanding, very challenging, very frustrating at times. But uh, the the length of the game and the... 
mm-hmm. the length of the game and the complexity of the gameplay, uh, I think makes the makes the typical Metroidvania uh, sort of competency curve all the more satisfying. Because mm-hmm. because you really. I mean, there are some sections, especially early on in this game, where I was banging my head against a wall. You have to for, work for it. <laughs> for a while, you yeah, know? Yeah. But but now that I've gotten some charms, I've gotten some upgrades, I've, I've, I've gotten some new powers and abilities, I, I feel much more... I feel much more capable. Hell, and you, I, I it feel takes like five more, hours just to get to the first where you can dash. Right, oh or, or like double jump, like double jumping in this game because you have to go so long without it feels like such a fucking revelation. It feels... It, it's so goddamn refreshing to be able to finally hit that button again and have him jump again because yeah. I, I like by You're the time i to. got to double jump i'd been i've been doing that for 10 hours you know yeah to no avail and i i kind of like early on in the game i there was there was like this moment of like oh my god is this how it's gonna feel the whole time like i don't know if i like the way this controls but as the game opens up and kind of blossoms it becomes much more than you expect of it you know absolutely and and, and i think that's Fucking wonderful, and I also I also enjoy the fact that like even though I've become much more powerful and I've become much more competent, like a Souls game, anything in this game can be threatening if you let it. You know, yes. if if you let something gang up on you, if you if you get a little cocky and try to you know get a little greedy and go for a hit that maybe you shouldn't go for, you'll pay for it. You know, I I I I think that I think that that has that makes the experience very challenging, but also very rewarding you know yes um yeah fuck yeah this game's great i i really can't wait to see what this team does next i i kind of hope i kind of hope the next thing they do is something completely different you know but at the same time th- this this game kind of represents a, a very clear vision and purpose in game design and it's it it's a good game damn crispy this should have been your number one yeah All right, we're done with the shit. This is now the top five. My number five game, 2017, was Prey. Oh. Prey is a good game. Were you guys aware of this? Yeah, yeah, so. yeah totally aware. Okay, this game is so fucking good. I, I'm, I'm really upset that it didn't get... It didn't get the numbers that I guess they were, you know. I don't think Bethesda for. had a great year for numbers, despite yeah. having some of the best games of the year. I know they like, like I, I don't think this is by any means a perfect game, but I think it's very ambitious and very uh, inventive and creative in what it's trying to do. You don't get a lot of these open world like system shock derivative games anymore. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think, I think the, you know, the closest thing recently within the last 10 years or so would have been like bioshock you know yeah mm-hmm. but this kind of ups the ante on that whole thing Th- this this instead of instead of still playing as a pseudo open world mostly linear narrative opens up into like a more true quote unquote open world experience with freedom. talos one you know yeah complete with, freedom to explore talos one right as its own self-contained environment and i thought that was a beautiful move it, it it offered a sense of agency that I honestly wasn't expecting. Like even when I started playing it, and I first began to realize, like, oh, I'm just gonna be moving around this station mm-hmm. however I want, and, and then and then compounding that with like, oh, and I can go outside the station too. Like that was such a wonderful surprise. Like that was such a that was such a revelatory moment, and probably one of the most satisfying I've experienced all year. Not just outside the station but like you that moment when you see like that space shuttle drifting yes. off like so far like it's like it's tiny you, like you look at it it's like so far away it's like i wonder if i can go to it boom did you see it you can go to it, it so it's cool. almost like it's almost like the game i don't i don't know that it's really underplaying expectations but it's constantly just kind of like surprising you with how far you can push things exactly like how far you can go and, and there are a number of different interesting systems in the game that that interact with each other in unique ways i love the inventory system i love i love loot in this game mm-hmm. i love how i love crafting specifically how everything in the game everything can just be broken down any, into its base materials any and weapon then, you you can anything. you can destroy all i mean of your to weapons. the point where like 
like there were videos of people like taking all the furniture in the lobby section of Talos One, throwing it in a giant pile, and then like throwing dis- uh, the um, the grenades that make yeah everything. the displacer charge or yeah. the recycler charges yeah. at it to just turn it into like a fountain of resources. It just turned the room into like a ball oh, pit. Oh my <laughs> god, it's so goddamn cool! Like that 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 is that is a very unique amount of complexity for something like that you know Mm -hmm. for for a game like this i was very surprised by pretty much everything this game had to show me i i I love that i love too that you can like you can read the emails on on people's computers and then you can literally later in the game find where that other person corresponding yeah yeah yeah. you can track down every single person working on that station in fact a lot of the story is kind of told through the, the sort of left behind fragments of this like very popular of the, the people of this very once populated place yeah. you know and there's some really interesting moments in the game like uh, like the the D side quest yeah. is really fun where you find you find the D room where it's like people have been playing this rpg and and you, you you learn all their names there and then you like find a quest to the like the dm has has sent everybody like treasure maps with to, to hide like these little secrets and, and you track all those down. I was going to ask you if you did that quest. Cause. I did. Yes. It, 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 it was, I mean, I, I loved it. Like I felt like there were characters in this game that you never hear or ever like see or anything. You just really know them as like names on emails, but like you kind of get a sense of who they are. Yeah. You, know, you get a sense of like what their problems were and what they were dealing with. And it was all very, very interesting. Another thing I want to mention about this game is I absolutely love the production design of it. Everything yes. looks so cool in this game. I, I, f- I feel like the last game, I, I th- like Bioshock had a very s- definitive sense of place to it. Like, yes. you know, like Rapture was a very well-defined environment. I feel like Talos 1 is exactly the same way in terms of... But in space... What's, but in sp- what's, I mean, not interesting, like, what's interesting about this, though, is that it all kind of ties into the... So the story of the game, I mean, this game, like, the, this world of Prey is an alternate reality to our own. Yeah. It takes place in the future, yeah. but its its past is very different from ours. Like, yeah. diverging back to, like, the 60s, mm-hmm. I think, is, is when it really starts to, like, yeah. change. Uh, like, Kennedy isn't assassinated. Yeah, like, the events it. leading up to yeah. why Talos 1 was even created and launched. So what you end up with is this world that has to look familiar yet alien you know and and they do that really well by by kind of transposing a lot of these like mid 20th century art deco stylings into this like space setting which i think works incredibly well there were some great ideas in this game that i think were criminally underutilized like i love the whole fiction and the idea around like looking glass technology and Mm -hmm. i really wish that that was featured a little more prominently in the gameplay like there's one really cool sequence where you're in a looking glass laboratory and you have like this three-way display that you're kind of like moving around to try to catch all the details of where somebody put something in the room so that you can like track it down yeah. yourself. Which or you're like really finding neat. a hidden safe in the yeah. room and stuff too. Or, or like just these little moments. Like like I remember there was one time I I threw something and it hit a it hit a, an aquarium or like a terrarium something that was behind glass and that whole thing shattered and I realized oh that's not a real thing at all. It's looking glass and there's a room behind it like. That like there's some really fucking cool moments like that, wow. especially on the bridge, the the whole bridge thing. Like, I I love the way that whole thing looked, that whole giant looking glass yeah. display. Uh, but yeah, th- this game, I don't know, it, it was something, it was really special, and I I feel like a lot of people missed out on it, and that's really shameful. This 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 should have been a game that everybody who was even remotely interested in shooters or you know single player story experiences should have paid attention to this should have been a shoe in success for bethesda and i'm afraid it may not have been well you know i mean i I think a lot of their games recently have 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 had underperformed yeah poor performances but i hope that doesn't slow them down i would love 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 to see more of this world or at least some of the concepts explored in this game in the future absolutely fucking mm, beautiful Guess what my number four game is, Carlos? Uh, Fortnite. That actually would have been better. For honor. <laughs> Shit. No. God damn it. The memes. Uh, no. My number four game for this year was Night in the Woods. How'd you like it? Carlos, I really liked this game. It was a lot of fun. I think it was very charming. 
I connected with the story on a very uh, base emotional level. Could you could you identify with the characters? I could identify with each of them in a very specific yet different way. Could you say that these characters in the game are representative of either people you have met in real life? Or, like, personalities of people you've met in real life? Um, yes. I, I think maybe even a better way to describe it would be the situations that these people find themselves in are very representative of people I've known and the situations they've been in. And situations I've been in. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I, I bet it's not only yours, but also, like, people in this day and age, you know? Absolutely. I think... I think this game, especially it being about, you know, kind of wayward, college-educated young adults from towns that are experiencing harsh economic downturn, like, that is that is very prescient to what has been going on in the last decade in this country, I think. You know? And it helps that the, that the art and the music in the game were... I think genuinely delightful. The, mu- the music is amazing. I wasn't too fond of this game. I was looking forward to it for yeah. quite a bit. Mm-hmm. But it came out too late for me. I kind of outgrew its target demographic. Yeah. If it come out like, like yeah. three years ago. I would have been like, man, this is me. This is me. But now I'm one of the bad guys in the game. It's okay. It's okay, Carlos. Sometimes, sometimes we're all the bad guy. The music's really good. I got a little off track there. I was going to say that I really like music. The music is really good. I think it's probably one of the strongest points of the game. But yeah, Night in the Woods. Delightful little emotional romp. Okay, Carlos, how about my number three game? Can you guess what it is? Can you make sure it's actually number three? It is number three. Let me double check. Hang on. It is... Yep, number three. Hi. My number three game for 2017 is Near a Tomato. A Tomato. A Tomato? Automata. Near Automata. So, I know you didn't like the music in this game. I did not like the music. I just didn't like it as much as everybody Why else. Why do you hate the music in this game, Crispy? I don't know. I just... It's not... I don't hate it. Did you mute the music? I did. Yeah, for the whole thing. I plugged in my headphones into my controller and then didn't put the headphone back. And played the whole thing in silence. That's, pretty, that's a pretty good trick. That's what I did. That's that's how I experienced That's obviously not what I did. But maybe it would have been better? Who knows? Obviously I liked it. It's number three on my list. I don't know if I can exactly explain why I liked it. Because I think a lot of what really worked for others didn't work as much for me, but I still came away from the end of the game feeling like I had had a worthwhile experience, you know? Like, 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 the game, whether or not I always agreed with it, was in and of itself a, a complete, coherent piece of art. You get what I'm saying? No. Okay. Did you play the game? A little bit. How much? Uh... Five hours, maybe? Oh, wow. Okay. So. That's just barely scratching the surface, right? Right. Like, the first playthrough of Track A is, like, 20 hours or something like that? Yeah. I mean, the, the playthroughs get quicker as you go along. Um, as the revelations I'm going to ask you something real quick. Like, I did not play the game, but I did give in and ended up reading the plot synopsis on Wikipedia. Sure. Like, the whole thing. Sure. And every time, like... Every time I see you talking about the game, it it seems like it weighs heavy on you, like it affected you on some complex emotional level. And me, after reading the wiki, I, I just don't get it. Sure is slippery. I don't either, to be honest with you. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I can explain in concrete, objective terms exactly what is good or what I enjoyed about the game. But I, I definitely experienced it on an emotional level. You know what I mean? Like, I, I didn't necessarily have an investment in the story, per se, but I 
was invested in the characters and wanted to see them reach some kind of conclusion. And, you know, this being a Yoko Taro game, that conclusion isn't necessarily clean or pretty. You know what I'm saying? But, but, ah, man, I don't... But that's not exactly a negative, right? No, no, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. I, uh, wow, yeah, this is really disappointing probably for some of the people watching this video that I can't, like, nail this game down, but I can't. But that, I feel like that's okay. Like, Why is it so high on your list, then? Because of all the games I played this year, this one really did, like, affect me the most. It didn't just, like, wash over me, you know what I'm saying? I didn't finish this game and put it away and then just, like, stop thinking about it. Like, here I am months and months after the fact, like, still thinking about this game and, like, talking about it and, and trying to, you know, put my finger on it, basically. And I, I, I feel like there's some value in that. I feel like there is value in the fact that it has stuck with me so drastically over the course of this year to the point where, like, I'm at the I'm at the point now where, like, I kind of feel like I just want to reinstall the game and play the whole thing over again just to kind of help process what I think about it. You know what I mean? I haven't had a lot of time to do that, but I would like to do that. And that's why I, I put it at number three. Okay. This is my penultimate game. This is my number two. This oh, one's, shit. This one's the deuce. All right. This one's number two. Divinity Original Sin 2. Hey, you know what? This game's pretty fucking good. That's there's what I a, hear. There's a lot going on. I, I didn't really play that much of the original Divinity, although I've heard wonderful things. I've heard wonderful things about both. Never played either. Always wanted to play both. I feel like this game is a very faithful adaptation of tabletop RPG design and elements translated into a video game. It, it does a lot more than a lot of modern RPGs to uh, to preserve some of the kind of interesting things about tabletop RPGs that you don't typically see in video games. A lot of like the social interactions, the way the the way that the characters can interact in the world pretty much as they choose mm -hmm. there's there's a there's a um there's a high degree of what you might call verisimilitude mm -hmm. across the game so so everything is very much uh represented in real time in the game it's it's all very systems based and and driven there which which leads to very interesting situations where if you are creative enough with the tools you have or with the abilities you have you can kind of circumvent problems that in another game would just be a scripted problem you know like can't get through this door like oh well you have fire magic burn it down you know things like that and to the point where the game is not concerned with you absolutely fucking up a storyline. Yeah. Like, you can you can do something to complete one storyline that absolutely destroys another storyline, not, not because they're diametrically opposed or anything, but because, like, this storyline, as one of its, like, throw-off objectives, makes you kill this person, which that guy also happened to be part of somebody else's storyline that you may or may not have stumbled upon, you know? It, it, it's, all these, it's all these different stories and missions kind of just running on their own parallel to each other and it, and i think that is really cool and i don't i feel like a lot of big name big time rpgs nowadays don't really have anything like that they're not really trying to create this world that's bigger than you operating at its own pace that you're just kind of moving around in they they try to center action around the player character or the party and and the main sort of conflict of the game more directly. You it's rare I mean? that games do, that games don't concern themselves with the the concept of like like they're not concerned with the player being able to do everything. Like right. It's just about what you choose to do and what you choose to do has consequences and I, I that's think, okay. Exactly. I think this game is is a perfect example of like a sandbox type game. Okay, more so than even say like, to a certain degree more so than like other open world games where basically what you have is a lot of space with a lot of different trailheads to these kind of enclosed, more scripted quests or storylines, you know? Mm -hmm. um, here, all that gameplay and all that, all the, all the quests are kind of kept in the same 
box of play as one another so that they can kind of interact and bash into each other in weird ways. Um, on top of that, I mean, that's just the single player game. That's yeah. just the base game. On top of that, there there are... There, there's the arena if you're really into doing like like PvP or uh, some online stuff, and then there's also like game master mode, which unto itself could have been boxed and sold as a program for twenty, thirty, forty bucks, and probably done pretty well for itself. It's this entire suite of of tools to basically run actual tabletop RPGs using the visual tool sets of the game. So you would actually get a group of players together, all of them controlling a single character, and you'd get a game master who actually runs a game instead of the computer, like, dealing with that stuff. You have somebody on another end, like, moving characters around, mo- like, casting spells, having having events happen, showing you maps and stuff like that. It, 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 it's, it's a very cool, very ambitious idea that, that Larian not only, like, pulled off, but did it kind of handily you know yeah. like like made made it look a lot less monumental than it actually is yeah you know it's, what I'm a, it's a fascinating mode I, i'd be really interested to see like I, I hope it's the kind of thing that that people that are really into that are actually getting behind it and using a lot i'm not sure has it been a super successful mode for the game or um that i don't have an answer for i'm not really sure i think i think maybe we're still in a phase where a lot of people first of all i i haven't heard that many people outside of our core community really talking about this game yeah um that could just be my own ignorance maybe this game is is widely beloved by the greater community and i just haven't heard it but i i kind of feel like it maybe has been underplayed a little bit yeah you know and and that might be due to the fact that it's a crpg you know i I think there's something about that that is still kind of niche you know Mm -hmm. i for one took a while to get into this to this basically because of that you know? yeah so I, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people who would actually end up enjoying this game maybe haven't uh gone out of their way to take a look at it you know like me like you but <laughs> but but everything about this game i think from from the single player from the from the combat which is so wonderfully just D D ish and I love that to, to the story, which I think is, is really compelling to, to, you know, the kind of the, the miscellaneous aspects of the game, like GM mode, thinking of that as being this, the stigil miscellaneous thing to this other larger, greater product is, is crazy to me because that alone, I think would have been worth a price tag on yeah. its own. Um, but yeah, this, this game was very surprising, you know, as, as uh, loath as I am to admit it, admit it, Brad absolutely was right on this one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is my... So Divinity Original Sin was my number two of 2017. Cool. All right, Carlos, here it is. My number one game of 2017, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Your thoughts? All right, Chris, here's what we're going to do. I'm never going to play this game, mm. so you need to fill me in on what I'm missing. But the whole time, I'm going to be holding my breath. Okay. If you talk too long, I will die. Okay. I'll try to do this. Uh, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is a delightful action RPG set in the Legend of Zelda universe. Uh, It has delightful art direction. Everything in this game looks absolutely gorgeous. But the thing I really, really enjoy about it is its breadth of simulated systems. This game is very much dedicated to never telling the player no if it doesn't have to. So, for instance, when I, as the player, am exploring Hyrule, and I find a tree or a tower or a mountain that I want to climb, and I'm like, hey, can I climb that? The game doesn't say no, like a lot of games would. It says, you are certainly welcome to try. Do you have enough stamina? Do you have enough stamina-boosting items? Do you have proper equipment to get up there? If you do, yes, you can. If you don't, no, you can't. You fall, you die. Uh, but it, it's not just climbing that is that sort of... Uh, consistent throughout the game every 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 like ability and power that you have that interacts with objects in the world uh interact consistently with one another so you can combine <sighs> i'm dead crispy okay you died i'm sorry but anyways you, you kind of get where i was going with that right yeah. it doesn't it doesn't matter you're dead um i'm sorry that i killed you with my love of Legend of Zelda, but I, I guess the moral of the story is if I had to sum up why I like this game in 
you know, the amount of time that it would take you to suffocate, I'm sorry, you would suffocate. I really love this game that enough much. To kill me. I, I love this game enough to let you die, Carlos, and that is why it is my number one game of 2017. All right, there it is, my top 10 games of 2017. This has been a crazy year. There are a lot of games that I know would have ended up on this list had I had time to play them. But unfortunately, time is a finite construct built in our minds to confound and imprison us until the day we die, until we're reclaimed by the void from whence we come. <laughs>